So good afternoon. Thanks, everyone, and, and for the privilege of, uh, of being here today. Um, I'd like to start with a quote from uh, the brilliant inventor Richard Stein that you see here, who comments on a woman's relationship with her hair. Uh, in a book that he calls Split Ends. Um, and he really contemplates here, and I think captures in a single quote, uh, the essence, particularly for women, uh, of the connection between their external appearance and what's going on inside. Uh, in particular, the ability to perform well in life. So Richard Stein may not be known to many of you here um, for what he invented. And what he's famous for is actually inventing the shag haircut. He's a master hairstylist. He's also, I think, a pioneer and a feminist. Uh, and in many ways, uh, here you can see a philosopher. Richard's been on the front lines of a woman's relationship with their hair for 40 or 50 years now. He still runs a salon on the Upper East Side. Uh, but he's known for the shag haircut for a very important reason. In the 1960s and 70s, as women were becoming, uh, entering the workforce, as we acquired pantsuits, birth control, and began to work out of the home, uh, it was Richard who realized at that time that a woman's need to communicate her new status in society was to move away from the madmen hair bouffants that we're so familiar with and move toward a more free hairstyle. And so Richard calls this no care hair. And the reason you're all sitting here today without bows and headbands uh, is thanks to him. And so he really, I think, captured uh, the need uh, and the ability of a woman to use her hair to communicate. And so what I'd like to try and do today is convince you that hair loss is actually a communication disorder as much as it is uh, a part of dermatology. So. This reflects my daily struggle, um, the difference between perception or expectation and reality. I'm sure many of you men and women alike can relate to this on a given day, particularly today. I thought it was apropos to have a bad hair day to give this talk. But nonetheless, uh, this reflects, I think, many women's and men's relationships with their hair uh, and how we attempt uh, to groom. Um, you'll hear this phrase in the literature uh, on the street. Gee, I'm having a bad hair day. What does that actually mean? Well, to have a bad hair day, you actually need to have hair. So um, the, another famous philosopher uh, and stylist, uh, Coco Chanel, and this is a very deep quote, I think. When someone changes their hair, either the cut, the color, the length in a profound way, male or woman, uh, teenager or child, you can pretty much bet that something else is about to change. People do not undertake radical change to their hair whether they're celebrating, whether they're mourning, whether they're grieving, whatever it is, whether they're changing jobs, a haircut often marks a life event. So you've seen other examples from the animal kingdom. That was not planned. I don't know how that happened. So we see variation in hair across the animal kingdom. Some of it is naturally occurring. Some of it is environmental. Some of it is self-inflicted. Nonetheless, Variations in hair are, again, a means of communicating. What is the message trying to be sent here? Crying out for help, perhaps? Uh, celebration? Whatever it may be. Hair, historically, throughout the animal kingdom and in uh, human primates, uh, is used as a means of communicating. And you'll hear this phrase. Sometimes when someone has a really bad hair day, they just don't want to get out of bed. They don't want to leave the house. They put their hair up in a bun. They wear a hat if it's a baseball cap, whatever. But no one wants to face the world with a bad hair day. We find humor in this part of hair. We look at this. We make a joke. We say to ourselves, oh, I'm having a bad hair day. It's something playful in a way. This changes when someone has a no hair day. And this is a really important difference. When someone loses every strand of hair on their head, something changes. This is a profound event. And patients who suffer from complete hair loss, whether it's from chemotherapy and it's transient, whether it's a male patient who decides to shave their entire head and look like an athlete, whether it's a child with alopecia areata that's new onset, or an adult woman, a no hair day is not a joke. It's not a laughing matter. It's not something that we make fun of in ourselves. And it frequently is something that causes a patient an incredible amount of psychosocial stress. So in dermatology, we battle all the time about creating legitimacy 
for hair loss as a research topic. And anyone with this type of hair loss would tell you that this is a, a disease that decimates their spirit. It affects every aspect of their life. If it affects them from a child, it is the imprint that they grow up with. It is the wallpaper of their life. Children frequently deal with bullying, with uh, intimidation, with harassment. Patients are asked, Do you, have you had chemotherapy? Are you ill? It, the list goes on and on. So a no hair day uh, is not a laughing matter, and particularly when it affects children. You can imagine growing up as a small child, or worse, losing your hair in adolescence, particularly for young women, is a profoundly life-changing experience. And when the disease affects children like this, it's frequently irreversible. So these children will remain without hair for life. Think about a woman who uh, has the appearance such as this, and going from that to this. That is the effect of losing one's hair. Look at the look in her eyes, the look on her face. Is that defeat? What is that? Is that a grieving? Is it sadness? Um, this is what we're faced with when patients come in with complete alopecia. And yet, uh, still to this day, I hope to change that by the end of this talk, we don't have a lot to offer when someone comes in with such a profoundly uh, important and impactful problem. So to put a different spin on it, meet Sandra. So Sandra, as you can see here, has alopecia universalis, no hair anywhere. Uh, she's had it since she was 25. And Sandra's had a different response. So many patients will uh, become reclusive, be afraid to leave their home, wear a wig, uh, begin to disguise, to try and deal with the stigma. Something happens to a small number of patients with alopecia areata, this disease, uh, that I think, again, uh, reflects the loss of communication. When people become affected with this disease, I'd like to put forward today the idea that they, they lose the ability to communicate to the world in the way that they once were able to. So like a volcano, if you could imagine, uh, lava will find a place to punch through. And if a person with alopecia is unable to communicate the way they were used to, they will find another way. And Sandra is one of my heroes because this is what she's done with her alopecia. So she's uh, written a book, she's written a song, she's made a film, she started a support group. She became a beauty queen, a 2011 uh, uh, bald beauty queen uh, in North Carolina. She uh, wrote a book about uh, self-esteem. She's an advocate for autoimmune disease research uh, and she's a motivational speaker. This is an example of someone who has taken the challenge of hair loss uh, and turned it into something amazing. So I'd like to do a spin on Coco Chanel's famous quote and put forward today the hypothesis that a woman who loses her hair uh, can actually change the world. And I call that transforming pain into passion. I can speak to that personally because the same thing happened to me. So many of you here, I fear to think, were actually born on this timeline, which is terrifying. But nonetheless, <laughs> this is a map of the 1990s. These are the things that were going on in the world at that time. Uh, I remember this decade for one moment in history, and that's this date on May 10th of 1996, when the same thing happened to me. Uh, I became a patient with alopecia areata for the first time. I presented in my hair salon to the person who cut my hair regularly. Uh, she looked and said, what happened back here? Did you have a biopsy? I came in the next day, uh, showed it to a colleague in dermatology uh, who let out a scream and said, it's really big. Uh, and so that began my odyssey. So as a patient with a derm disease like this, you're told three things. We don't know why it happens. We can't tell you what's going to happen. Is it going to go progress to complete alopecia, or is it going to stay the same or get better? And worse, there's nothing we can do about it. How many areas of medicine that you all are studying can you say are still faced with those three same questions? Don't know what it is, can't tell you the prognosis, and nothing we can do about it, except go home and relax and don't be stressed. Not very satisfying. Um, so I, of course, went through the, the usual litany of emotions about this disease, as many people do. 
I was left with the why me, which again for many of us feels like this, why is this happening? Um, for me, being from New Jersey, hair is a big part of culture, <laughs> so uh, I really was quite stunned. I have a cousin who has complete alopecia universalis, so as a geneticist it, maybe it shouldn't have been totally surprising. Nonetheless, this was a shock. Those frustrations became the first three specific aims of an NIH grant that those of you in the audience who do this took nine times resubmission to actually get funded. But eventually my why me changed to a why not. This was 18 years ago. There wasn't a lot of genetic data available. But long story short, we've managed to make slight inroad into the disease. When I started in the field, to me, alopecia seemed like this. Everybody was talking about a different part of the disease. Nobody, I felt, was taking an unbiased approach to begin to understand uh, the genetic basis. We knew that it attacks the hair follicle. We knew that there was an immune infiltrate. But not a lot else was known. One thing to point out to you, despite the fact that alopecia is the most common autoimmune disease, uh, outranking many others combined, still, uh, due to the high prevalence, there are no randomized clinical trials have ever been performed in this disease, and that's quite stunning. Those that have been performed were done using one-off trials from psoriasis drugs that were known to work uh, without very much success, and now we think we know why. All of this set the stage for uh, using a genetic approach to find the disease genes. And so uh, we did a first GWAS study, identified the first uh, eight genes. Uh, a very nice biological candidate emerged from that that led us down uh, a path of uh, cellular uh, immunology experiments and more genetics experiments. Um, we were shocked to find that, to our surprise, alopecia didn't resemble the other skin autoimmune diseases. It actually resembled uh, others. So it's not like psoriasis and it's not like vitiligo. We were barking up the wrong tree all that time. What it does look like, however, is uh, shown here, type 1 diabetes, rheumatoid arthritis, and celiac disease. And this was a shock because it, we struggled to really think about what would be in common uh, amongst these diseases and alopecia. So I didn't bring a patient along today, but I did bring the other part of my dream team. Dr. Raphael Kleins is here in the front row. Raphael is an immunologist, heme oncology, for those of you that are interested. Um, Raphael came up with this brilliant hypothesis to say, after doing three years of immunology experiments, could we find a way to disable the killer cells, the killer T cells in alopecia, using a small molecule JAK inhibitor? You already heard Dr. Raza talk about um, JAK kinases uh, it, briefly with tofacitinib. That's the same drug here. We're basically using a small molecule to disable the T cells. And because it's a small molecule, uh, it can be applied to the skin. It can be used topically. It can be used systemically. JAK inhibitors are a very active area of drug development right now, both for oncology and autoimmunity, among others. In a nutshell, we use these drugs to apply topically to uh, an, an animal model of alopecia areata, a mouse model known as C3HATJ, and you can see here after topical application, uh, as well as systemic, as well as uh, treatment in the setting of disease, as well as preventing disease, these drugs have a profound positive impact uh, on the trajectory of this disease and also completely eliminate those killer cells from the skin. So. In humans, uh, as you just heard about the power of comparative approaches, two drugs were approved in this pathway. Uh, just to acknowledge the other member of the Dream Team is Julian Mackay, who runs our clinical trials division here in dermatology. To truly translate these findings into the clinic, as you heard earlier, requires multiple people coming together for these teams, uh, and Julian really helped us uh, get this to the clinic. In a nutshell, this is a patient who's been treated with an oral JAK inhibitor for a few months now, and you can see she's gone from uh, severe alopecia to a full head of hair. This is another patient, 90% hair loss to a full head of hair in about four months. Quite a stunning result for a drug that we had no idea uh, would be useful in this disease and took the insights of a hematology oncology expert to know about this class of diseases, put it together with our knowledge in dermatology, and move that forward in a way that was, again, completely unexpected. This is another patient uh, on tofacitinib, a different drug, who also had complete alopecia and regrew a head of hair, suggesting that multiple drugs in this class will actually do the same thing. This is from an editorial that accompanies our paper, which if anybody's interested, is in the current issue of Nature Medicine, a hair follicles on the cover, which gave Raphael and I a great thrill to see our work uh, published with the headline uh, of using JAK inhibitors for alopecia. So please go see the paper. I'm not going to talk anymore about the data. I will come back to this, though, and say, for me, 
My frustration having this disease allowed me to communicate through science. But that's not always the way. I was lucky. I had a lab to go play in and a way to approach the disease that let me work through my experience as a patient in the lab. Here are some examples of other people who've done the same. So Kayla is actually um, Miss uh, Delaware. She accepted her crown uh, without her wig uh, and made many patients with alopecia very, very proud. Um, Vanessa is an entrepreneur and started a business in response to her own alopecia called Confident Curls, which is known in the field as Wigs on Wheels. She delivers hair pieces to underprivileged people uh, who need them. Uh, Margaret is, uh, transformed her complete alopecia into her business. Margaret is a fashion model and an actress, and you can see these absolutely stunningly uh, beautiful images and more on her website. Again, her way of communicating to the world. Uh, and Madonna Kaufman, who uh, is the founder of Locks for Love. Many of you have seen your friends and colleagues grow a long uh, ponytail, cut it off, and donate it to Locks for Love to make human hair prosthetics uh, for, uh, for patients with alopecia. Madonna uh, has not only founded this foundation, but also contributed to um, uh, research on this topic, ours included, uh, as well as others around the country. So not just the foundation, but more. And finally, patients with alopecia across the world using their alopecia to raise funds for research, in this case for Alopecia UK. Uh, when this disease affects someone, uh, people find a way uh, to communicate, and I think it's very clear um uh, how people have been impacted and been affected. Olivia is a 16-year-old teenager who experienced bullying firsthand and wrote this book that I think has empowered uh, many young teenagers and young adults uh, to educate their friends and classmates about this disease. And finally, I'll close with this image. So uh, Asra showed you a slide of the percent of NIH funding that's spent on cancer research. Um, I don't actually have a slide because the number is zero, so there'd be nothing to put on the slide about what's spent on hair research uh, by federal funds. Nonetheless, I hope, great hope, uh, I hope that in the future, since this is a TED talk and we're talking future, when Hillary wants to knock a story off the front page, this is someone who knows how to communicate with her hair. She just changes her hairstyle, and this is a famous quote on her part. Uh, I think the upshot, though, really is this. You would think she was saying this lightly. Uh, this was several years ago, but in fact, uh, recently in her memoir that's entitled Hard Choices, her alternate title was this. The Scrunchy Chronicles, 112 countries as Secretary of State, and they're still talking about her hair. So my hope for hopefully the next uh, several years will be that there will be scrunchies crawling across the White House lawn and even one in the Oval Office. So I'll stop there and thank you for your attention.